Okay, good evening, everyone, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the weekly financial fitness masterclass. There is a reason that we are doing that, and I'm going to tell you that in just a moment. But in the meantime, I would like everyone here to introduce yourself. This is very critical. I, I want to know the people that I'm in the room with tonight. And then the two things I would like to um, know is what you do for a living, because we're talking about financial fitness here. So, and then I would like to know from everybody what you want to walk out of this place with. Okay, so that's, that's very important. So I'll give you some moments to please do that in the chat. Everybody does that. Um, Williams, I'm also wondering whether people, it looks like um, most of the audience are not um, very familiar with using Zoom and they were probably expecting to use WhatsApp, but it doesn't look like WhatsApp call can take more than 32 people. Um, so this happens to be like what is possible. Um, it does appear that people are struggling with, um, with Zoom. So we might take out some time within the week and then help people, um, just like what you did with one of the participants. Okay. All right. Hello, Mesue. Is that how you pronounce that? Mesue? All right. Um, from Cameroon. Thank you for joining us. All right. So what are you, what are your expectations, Mesue? What do you want to learn? What do you want to walk out of this place with? And now this is very important. I'm, I keep repeating it. You know, when I work with my, uh, you know, we do something like this monthly for business owners. And it's important that people set out their intention uh, specifically, what is it you want to gain? Um, yeah, you don't want to stay, you know, spend all this time here and um, not work out with something very practical that you can you can actually implement, something that is useful for your life. Because many people who do the, the things that I do in this, uh, in Africa, most times there's a lot of theory. You know, people talk about, uh, you know, just theories, they tell stories and do narratives, you know, and people are motivated and they're excited. But the next morning, they have forgotten everything. You know, the excitement goes and then the people go back to their normal challenges. But here, we do our own things different. We do our own things very differently because the emphasis is on practical, 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 all right? And then to help you to work out of something, an event like this, with something that's very practical, the first step is always to state your intention. Why are you here? Why are you in this meeting? So I'd like everybody to think about that. And also what this does is that it also helps me to know, even though I have slides, I'm not usually married to my slides. But I would like to tailor the things that we are talking about to you. So it's important to know what it is, why you are here for, you know, for yourself. And again, this usually will be very interactive. That's another way to make it very practical. Because if we come here and then I just dish out lectures, like the lectures I give in Stanford or the lectures I give in Lagos Business School, it's just lectures. But if I hear from you, if you are open, if you are humble and open to learn, if you are also vulnerable, because I share my stories, I'm doing the things I'm doing right now because these are things I have gone through. I, so I'm going to share my own vulnerability with you. And then the only way I can know you and, and to be able to help you much better is for you to be vulnerable, okay? Uh, so let's all admit, we are not billionaires here, but we, we want to be 
We want to do well for ourselves, for our families, and for our God. We want to do well. And um, if we open up in this learning atmosphere, um, I might be able to really help you specifically. So I want you to think about what it, what is it that is holding you back? What is it that has been blocking you? Where are you feeling stuck as a person? And then in the light of all that, where you are feeling stuck, what is it you want to walk out of this masterclass with today? What is one practical thing? If you're leaving this place, one thing that you want to learn, that you want to do, one problem that you want to solve, something that has been a challenge for you for many years around your finances, and then you want it lifted. So I want you to put it in the chat. I'm going to give us time to do that because that is really very important part of the process for me. Okay. All right. Okay. So welcome, Paul. Um, you are all telling me what you do for a living. That's very good. Um, so I want you to tell me what you want to gain. Why are you here? Okay. Why, why are you here? All right, so I'm going to minimize this a little bit so I can read the chat. Um, and for those just joining, please take time and introduce yourself in the chat and um, take time, introduce yourself in the chat and tell me what you want to learn. What problem do you want to solve? Where have you felt stuck as a person that I can help you tonight? Because that's going to help me to know what I'm going to share with you. Okay. Um, Ngozi says to manage my shares. Chidema is a lecturer and researcher. Oh, welcome, Chidema. Okay. Irene is into liquor business, liquor business in um, Cameroon. Um, Ngozi is a mediator. All right. Okay. Keep it coming. Keep it coming. I want to know what you want to. Okay, Chidema wants clarity on how to multiply and manage income. All right. Um, Mosh wants to, okay, learn from me. All right. Okay. I want to learn how to invest and grow my finances. Okay. Very good. Keep it coming. Keep it coming. Let's take a couple more. Now, I want to tell you something about intentions. Why intentions are, you know, setting intention is very, very powerful. Very, very powerful. When I was going for my master's degree in geographic information systems in University of Ibadan, we were the very first class, the very first class of let me say West Africans, if not Africans. I don't know about South Africa, whether South Africa was offering remote sensing and geographic information systems at the time, but it was USAID and Iowa State University that partnered with University of, University of Ibadan, and then they took us to run that course. Now, when it was time for uh, projects for to write our thesis, many of my friends in the class chose to do things that would just, um, you know, take them very little effort and then they'll collect their certificates and disappear. And I don't blame them because there's a lot of certification, certificate orientation in Africa. Uh, for some people, when you invite them to the event that I'm having, the kind of event we're having right now, one of the most, their most important questions is, are you going to give us certificate? And so, Many of them did their projects and thesis and completed within two weeks, three weeks, and submitted. But I told myself, when I finish with this master's degree, what do I want to do with it? So I spent quite a lot of time in the Kennedy Library, the serial session, where most people don't go. I spent many days in the IITA library in Ibadan, reading, just researching, trying to find um, a lot more about the kind of work I could do. And then from all my research, I decided and I set my intention that I was going to work 
either with the military, because around that time when I did my postgraduate program, that was when um, around the time that the fourth, uh, the Bush, George Bush senior fought um, the war in Iraq. So I was very fascinated by the way they were using satellite and GIS technologies to do guided missiles and um, and all that to do precision targeting and all that. So I was I, I felt that that was a very good uh, very good area for me to focus on. Or I would work in the oil industry because I found that the oil industry were a very um, a very potential uh, consu consumers of the technology. So I now asked myself after setting that intention. I now asked myself if I was going to work with the military or with the oil industry, what problem would I solve with my project that would make me visible to them? So that was how I came up with this idea of three-dimensional GIS. And it was so complicated because nobody had done that before. We were the very first set. Even our professors didn't know how to direct me other than they were very hopeful that I was going to break through. Anyway, long story cut short, I was able to get that project done. It was extremely difficult. So my wife will remember when I would go to sleep overnight in the laboratory trying to crack that problem. It was hard. And um, I had a divine encounter, some divine moments, you know, that in my dream, I saw the answer to the technical problem that was making it difficult to do that project. I cracked it and that was around 3 a.m. in the morning when I was sleeping in the GIS laboratory. And now that happened and guess what? That was how I got into Shell because Shell saw that project and they were so amazed. And they were asking me, where did you do this? In Nigeria, they didn't believe I did it. Like I said, yes, I did it in Nigeria. So right there on the spot, they organized the interview through three de departments. You know, the remote sensing, the GIS, and then the card technology at that time. And voila, I started working in Shell. All I've told you now, I mean, even if you don't get anything else tonight, because many times we think that our financial problems have to do with money. But I can guarantee you, ladies and gentlemen, I have done this for years. And some of you have followed me from my television days. Um, I have taught in top business schools in the world and still teach in top business schools in the world. I have coached over 300 businesses across Africa. And I can tell you each time, and I've coached executives, uh, many people in the business world, you know, who, who, who are who, what they call who is who, um, I have had something to do for them, you know, through the work I did with uh, Lagos Business School as adjunct. And so one shocking thing I discovered is that most money problems, most financial problems or money problems are not caused by lack of money. So most financial problems are not money issues. So um, if you are able to set intention, because sometimes the money problem might just be that we've not really defined a vision of where we are going in terms of our finances, in terms of our purpose in life. And when your purpose in life is not very clear, not very well known, it affects finances. And so people wonder, what does mindset, what does, what does understanding our purpose, having clarity around what we are here for have to do with our financial life? A lot. Okay. So having said that, um, I just told you that so that you can understand the importance of whenever you come in to a program like this, set your intentions so that it is not when you now um come in here then it's like let us hear what he's going to say no 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 you say this is what i want to get out of this meeting because you will always get your intention like i set my intention to work in, in the oil industry and i worked in shell 
after working in Shell, still worked in Chevron and then back there. It's the power of intention. Okay. Um, so Ndukwe says he's a businessman interested in how you can access loans to expand my business. Okay. Um, I'm a civil servant. I want to grow my passive income to take over my paid job. All right, very good. Why I'm here, I've tried to do several things after leaving paid employment. I need somebody to hold my hand to be able to manage. Oh, okay, excellent. I want to grow my finances. Um, Gimba, I'm here to expand my knowledge in project management and how to secure a PM role, either remotely or through sponsorship visa abroad. Okay, Chike works in advertising. And I would like to expand my knowledge about investing in shares. Okay, very good. Okay, so let's get started. Um, the financial fitness class is not a one-time thing, right? So it is. It will happen every Saturday, right here. Um, so some of you join through the radio program, which we just started. So we have started a radio show that's going to go around the country. Uh, by Monday, we'll be in the second radio, okay? And then by next month, we'll be in several radio stations in Lagos. Uh, but then you can also watch these things online because we are also, we're also putting out the previous episodes as podcasts um, on YouTube. So for some of you who have not subscribed to the channel yet, it would be a very good thing to do because... Um, the financial challenges you've had for 40 years or for 30 years or for 20 years cannot be solved in 20 minutes, all right? So we're going to be building. So today I'm, I'm going to introduce you to the concepts of financial fitness, and then I'm going to show you a system. So whether you're thinking about investing in the stock market, we are thinking about real estate, we need to put everything in perspective. So I'm going to introduce you to a system so that we can do that system thinking. And then every Saturday, same time, same Zoom link, we will always come back and then talk a little bit more about it. Also, the other thing I'm going to do today is that we have two Q&A sessions, okay? So when we can get to speak to specific um, situations that you have raised here. So, but first of all, let's set this going and then we can always come back to that. Thanks for introducing yourself. Um, so for my, from my own part, my name is Obo Awoke Obo, right? Um, I happen to be the only one with this name in the world ever, and probably after me. So I started my career with Shell, and um, from Shell, uh, Chevron made me an offer I couldn't say no to. Um, because at that time, it was almost three times what Shell was paying me. So I quickly left Shell in Port Harcourt and then came to, that was how my family came to Lagos. Um, so I came to uh, Chevron in Lagos. Um, six years after working with Chevron, Shell came back, made a better offer. So I left Shell. So, sorry, I left Chevron and then went back to Shell. Um, so... While I was doing a project for Shell in the Shell International Office in uh, Rijswijk in Netherlands, I had an experience that changed everything, an experience that, that drove me to do what I'm doing today, you know, why I'm speaking with you today. So I asked myself while I was there, because at this time, I loved the job. I loved the Shell job, the peck of the, the pecs of the office world fantastic you know um anytime i was traveling outside the country you know i had shell protocol um and security picked me from the house to the airport and of course it was always business class so the perks of the job were okay <clears throat> so as far back as 2007 uh, when i was with shell um i was paid i not only had a car um you know an official car which I, I took the grant and then upgraded it to an SUV, but they were paying me as at that time, 60,000 Naira for fuel every month. Um, they took care of my medicals and then the family's medicals. Um, two of our children were born. 
Okay, one in Shell and the other one in Chevron. The other one was born before I started working with them. So the perks of the office were excellent. But for some reason, I wasn't feeling fulfilled. After a while, the excitement just started dying. And then I have found that over the years, you know, the way God has led me and the way he has worked with me, whenever I fell into such kinds of feelings, I knew that it was time to move on. Okay, so while I was in Netherlands, after work one day, because we didn't have the usual Lagos traffic, Wahala and all that, so there was just so much time you know, to go grocery shopping or walking around the neighborhood. So I came back one particular day and then I had this epiphany. I said, um, if I were on my deathbed and I was looking back and looking back over the years and I was about to take my last breath, <clears throat> what was it that I was going to look back to and say, this was a life well lived? As Paul was dying, you know, Paul said, I have fought the good fight, I've finished my course. So how would I look back? What was it I was going to look back to and say, this life was lived accurately, it was lived purposefully, and it was lived worthily. And then it occurred to me that as at that time, if I died, then the story would be, okay, he walked in Shell, he built a house in the village. He sent his children to good school. And I'm like, was that all? <laughs> was that all life was about? He had good cars. He built a house. His children attended good schools. And I'm like, God forbid, my life must be bigger than that. So I did an exercise, which I'm going to ask you to make a note and do that exercise. I talk about that exercise every single place I go, because that was the exercise that changed my life. So I took out a notebook and I asked myself, what were the 100 things I wanted to accomplish before I died? And of course, you know, uh, the scripture says that God walks in my heart, you know, to give me this, you know, when I walk with him, um, he gives me his desires. So I looked into my heart, into my spirit, and I made a list of the things that I wanted to accomplish before I died. And all these things had to do, a lot of them had to do with um, my relationship with, with God, my relationship with other people, and especially you know, with my family, and especially with my children. And then the impact that I wanted to leave out there in the world. And then it's amazing because the things I'm doing, including this one right now, I'm doing were on that list. Being on the on, on the television, starting a radio program that will cover the whole of Africa, we say from Tripoli to Cape Town. And then here we are, you know, kind of running those things that were on the list, you know, writing books, um, which I do now. So that exercise helped me. The 100 things I will accomplish before I die. So it focused me. And then I asked myself, if I were going to achieve these things, what kind of person? would I be? What kind of uh, personal development should I pursue? What kind of company, what kind of people should I have around me if I was going to accomplish those 100 things? So that was a very powerful exercise, which will encourage you to do. Um, so I quit Shell after I came back from Holland, a couple of months after I came back from Holland, and I started consulting and coaching, doing what I do today, working with businesses. Um, I'm a certified executive coach and uh, MBTI practitioner. Um, up to last year, I served as Stanford Seed Business Advisor. The Stanford Seed is an initiative of the Stanford Graduate School of Business in the US, which has been for many years now the top business school in the world. And so I had um, you know, the unique privilege for almost six years you know, to advise them in West Africa. Um, and my mission is to raise unicorns, billion dollar businesses privately held. That's my mission. That's the vision of our company. Who will lead the, the, the political, the spiritual, the political, the economic, and then the social transformation of Africa. And then many of us see what's already going on in Niger. And if you follow me on LinkedIn, you can see how controversial I am 
because those things, everything I post on LinkedIn and I post on social media connects to this mission, transformation of Africa. So after I, I quit Shell, I lost um, so much money, you know, very bad investments, one of them called Noskatko. And um, then I failed in the first business that we started and even in the second one. And then the struggle was very, very real. Right? So I really, really struggled bitterly for seven years. And all that involved not being able to pay my children's school fees, not being able to pay our house rent, um, and then even having to squat as a family for three years because I couldn't pay rent. And so we would have been technically homeless in Lagos of all places if God's mercy had not stepped in and he touched somebody you know, who gave us a place to stay. Um, and then through all that time, I was learning a lot. I was learning a lot about how many works. At some point, I was actually having uh, a conversation with God around what we were going through at that time because things were really, really very hard. And so when I see a lot of families, so I see individuals or business owners who are struggling, I can actually encourage you and tell you, don't be anxious. Don't, don't, don't let your heart be troubled. Don't, because if we could go through what we went through, I mean, to the depths. Can you imagine what it means that your children are at home because they couldn't, I couldn't pay school fees and they kicked them out. Um, the embarrassments were really, really bad. You know, but after seven years, just from nowhere, it's like everything just started reversing. And many of the things I'm going to share with you uh, every Saturday and also through the radio, um, because I find that so many families are struggling and going through the same things that we went through and they are struggling to find a way out of it. So I was saying that I was having a, that conversation with God and then he said, I had to let you go through this because you see, you want to help Africans economically, spiritually. See how that you are just coming from shell from that level, you, you've been flying first class, business class, everything you, you had, were living in a big house, Shell was buying generator for you. You know, Shell will buy like 40 kVA generator, or if you offer the money, they get. he said, you've been living at that level. That is like 0.1% of the people you are trying to help. So he said, I let you go through this thing so that when you are talking with these people, you can talk with authority, you can talk with empathy because you've been there, you can talk with compassion and then you can talk with authority because I have allowed you to go through that thing and come in. So what we're doing in the financial masterclass is not the usual come here and get rich uh, quick. It's not the usual whatever, you know, we, we, we want to pluck the problems from the root. And I want to share with you, you know, just all these things. And so I developed a system I'm going to introduce you to today called Cash. I took all the experiences and the graces that we experienced, you know, during these very difficult times. And I took all the things that I learned that worked when I was working for Stanford University. And then all the businesses I've worked for um, uh, clients have coached some of them, you know, you know, like Flutter Wave, like MTN. We've done quite some bit, you know, for them. Um, so taking all those things that worked, and I put it into a cash system. So I'm going to be talking about that today. Okay. So um, this is what we'll cover tonight. We just finished with the introductions. We will talk about. What exactly is financial fitness? And then I'm going to build some escalators in your mind by giving you steps to financial fitness. What is, what is the first thing to do? What is the next thing to do? What is the next thing to do? So that we'll be as practical as possible. 
I'm also going to show you a worksheet, all right, that we have developed, made it extremely accessible for you. And I'm going to tell you how to get that worksheet. And every financial masterclass will always have a worksheet that can allow you to implement because I want to stress it and stress it over and over again. It is not just in accumulating knowledge. All of you here, all of you here, you already have enough information in your head to do so much. But the problem, the missing, the missing connection is action. And then sometimes what is missing in the action is basically that no one, somebody talked about handholding. No one has helped you to see how you can bridge the gap be between the theories, between the things you know already that you're carrying in your head and um, get a, getting that thing done. So that's why I'm going to be introducing you to lots of worksheets, okay? And ladies and gentlemen, what I've noticed, I've worked with Europeans, I've worked with Americans, uh, like literally all my life. I haven't worked very much with Asians, okay? Just a few of them, the Asian, Asians I've worked with, Asian American, you know, Americans you know, in, in Chevron. But there's one fundamental difference between us Africans and those people I noticed. These are our Western brothers and friends. They take time to do a lot of thinking, planning, and writing. And if you have something to write down, make this note. Just make notes of what I'm telling you. Because these things are not theories. There are things I see in the field there. They spend so much time thinking, journaling, writing things down, not carrying things in your head. So one habit I would like you to develop from today, just going forward, is the habit of writing things down, thinking on paper, not carrying things on your head. There's always a big difference between the man or woman who carries things in her head and the one who actually thinks on paper. And then some of you here can actually testify to that. So when you get this worksheet, relax, set out time every single day to do thinking. I do a lot. I, I would actually say that more than half of my day, like every single day, really more than half is thinking. And then sometimes I'm driving, you know, I'm, my, my wife would tell you, sometimes I'm driving, something just comes, there's always paper. There's always a notepad or something around me, just around me, or I will use uh, the notes, the memo on my iPhone to dictate something. So you see post-it post -it notes are uh, all over, everywhere I am, you know, as post-it notes, I see this three by five inch thing. I have journals of all kinds of things because the people I've worked with, like in Stanford, every single week, what worked, what didn't work. Everything we did was debriefed. And then because of it, things kept on getting better. Because when you write things down, when you do a lot of thinking, critical thinking, and you write things down, it helps you to continue to improve. So the mistakes you made last year, you're not repeating them this year. And that's what you do. Okay, so these worksheets are very, very um, important. And they are also very, very, very affordable. We made it almost literally free, okay, so that it can help you to implement everything that we're doing. Then we'll have question and answer sessions, which is more like consulting, when I will take your specific questions and then we can deal with it, okay? Uh, how's it going? Type in the chat. Yes, if it's or super, just how is it going? How is it going? Are we connecting? Just type super. If we are connecting, if it's making sense, you know, so, so far. Okay. All right. Good. Good. Okay. Super, super, super. All right. Awesome. Awesome. Very good. Okay. All right. So let's get started with it. There are three kinds of fitnesses I would like everyone in the team and also in the WhatsApp group to pursue. All right. The spiritual fitness. Uh, and then the, the truth is, None of these things can work without the other two. 
So it's true that we are focusing on financial, but you can tell already that I have incorporated lots of elements of the spiritual, all this while we are speaking. And then if you are spiritually fit, but you are not physically fit, you know, your health is very, very poor. There's a, a serious misalignment. Okay. If you are physically fit and you don't have money, you see lots of them all over the place, physically fit and you don't have money, your journey will also be very difficult. Okay, so if you're spiritually fit and then you don't have financial fitness, it's going to be a problem. It's going to limit your impact in the world. It's going to limit the number of people you can touch. It's going to limit the, um, the things you can achieve, you know, for yourself, for, the, for your family, for God. All right, so you need all this fitness, spiritual fitness, physical fitness, and financial fitness. But our focus every Saturday is on financial fitness. But the radio program will also be touching on all these ones. Okay, how did I start talking about financial fitness? Now, the origin story uh, a few of you here probably have heard that story or read it in, in the newspaper, was the Dana crash of June of 2012. Um, let me cut it short for the sake of our time. But my name was on that, on that plane. We had gone to do something in Abuja. And then last minute, uh, I decided not to go with this one but to go with my friend to see my son who was in Loyola Jesuit College at the time in Abuja. And then I told the MTN protocol, we were doing something for MTN. MTN was running a business plan competition, which they called, um, I forget what they called it, aspiring business or whatever, in a business plan competition. And then we were the judges. So we're traveling around the different zones in the country and people were pitching their business ideas. And then we were judging the business plan so that we'll be able to select for MTN the uh, three winners for the program. So we told the coordinators, you know, Wale and myself, to remove our names from that flight because we wanted to go to Loyola and come back. And then to put our names in the last Dana flight, you know, that, that evening. Story cut short, as we're leaving Loyola to go to the airport, we received the news of this unfortunate incident. That's actually the picture of that crash. Now, um, you need to know how emotional this was for me. Not just that all the people who we worked with for this MTN thing, all of them perished. You know, we had just shaken hands in that hotel where we were and told them, see you soon in Lagos. And then since that day, in June of 2012, we still haven't seen our colleagues. So it's very deeply emotional for me. And then some people, even whole families, you know, perished in that uh, flight. Very, very sad incident. Every time I remember it, and it really angered me, you know, when all the backstories about that plane uh, came up. But this was one thing it did for me. We couldn't go back that day because we were, the whole place was so traumatized and the people were just so traumatized that. But, but I asked myself that night, if I had died in that crash, under what, what condition would I have left my wife and three young children at the time? None of them had even entered. They were still in primary school school and secondary school. I think later that year, uh, the last one, the youngest, you know, got into secondary school. So it was still in secondary schools. And at that time, that was the time I was, uh, the seven years I was telling you about that were really very, very challenging after I left Shell. Things were just not working. We didn't have a house. We didn't have steady income. Paying school fees was very, very difficult. It was just quite erratic. And so it opened my eyes to um, the need to think in terms of 
never letting it happen either to me or to anyone I know alive that something like that happens to you and that you depart this world without having um, you depart this world without having made a plan for the people that you love. Okay, so Kalista's hand is up. We can tap it in the chat to so just hang on um, because we'll soon get to where we will ask questions. So that was the origin of my financial fitness. And so how do we define financial fitness? So this is how we define financial fitness. And incidentally, it's just my two sons and myself, you know, um, we were having this conversation not long ago. And then um, three of us came up with this definition of financial fitness. So it is having the ability to grow and protect your financial well-being and the immunity to financial adversity. So in other words, you are financially fit. If whatever happens, when there's a financial crisis or there's economic crisis, you're physically fit, just like when you're physically fit and diseases come, they don't get you or you fall. You know that somebody who is physically fit, if the person has a fall, it is easier on the person than someone who is not physically fit falling. There have been many stories where people fell and died from a simple fall. And it's the same thing, you know, with financial fitness. You have immunity to financial adversity. So even when other people are falling, they are collapsing, like today, so many people are complaining about the economy and things are not going well and all that. So financial fitness means that you're, you're financially fit. You're immune to whatever they are doing. Whatever, whatever Tinubu and his government are doing, whatever Joe Biden, whatever NATO and Ukraine and Russia are doing, whatever China is doing, you are immune to them. That is what financial fitness is. So I want to take a little poll. Um, so in the chat, now, with the understanding you have about your financial fitness, how would you rate yourself? Okay, there is bad, there's poor, there's average, there's good, there's excellent. Now, as of the time that I had that um, Dana crash, uh, plane crash, my fitness was already like was like zero, if not minus. Okay, and so, but now it has shifted a little bit, you know, from bad, that red particular place, to I would say it is in the. It's somewhere between poor and average. That's where I am now. So just to give you context for myself, okay? So I'm in that, let me see, can you see my mouse? Okay, I don't know if you can see my mouse. So this is really where I am. So if I'm going to uh, give, uh, so I'll probably give myself like 3.5. Average will be like five. Uh, so between poor and average will be like, okay, maybe like four where I am now, okay? So I would say I'm somewhere between poor and average. All right, so type your own in the chat. Where is your, where do you find yourself, you know? Um, where, how do you state your financial fitness using that chat that's there? All right, I just minimize so that I can see. All right, there's bad, okay? Go on, go on. I would like to get everybody here um, having, to, okay, so there's poor, there's poor, there's bad. All right, looks like I'm in good company. It's bad, bad, okay. All right, your financial fitness, keep going, keep going, keep going, everybody. Between bad and poor, okay, okay. Um, Coyote created it in very bad. There's no very bad. <laughs> okay, okay, you say you created your own skill. <laughs> That's very funny. All right, bad, bad, poor, okay. Um, average, Moshi, that's very good. Poor, bad, okay. So I can see that many of us are actually in the same, uh, in similar situation. So mine is between poor and average. And then I can see that quite a number of us are you know, just, um, yeah, bad and poor. Okay. So we are going to do something about it. And this has begun to introduce us to the three steps to financial fitness. Only three steps. I didn't want to make it 17 steps or 32 steps, just three steps. 
And I'm going to tell you, you know what, because those are the steps I am taking that my family is taking right now as I'm talking to you. Even this thing I'm doing is part of, you know, that plan. So I'm going to show you those steps. Um, why financial fitness? I mean, that is really very self-explanatory, um, you know, why you must be financially fit. Um, okay, so you 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 need to be self-reliant, and especially in, in this part in Africa, uh, many people, the only financial problem solving that they understand is making phone call. Once it's a financial situation, the first thing is who will I call? So if you do that like once or twice, that's okay. But when, when it becomes a situation that anytime you run into financial problem, you have the first impulse is who do I call? Uh, you know, and then some people even have lists. They will call this person, call this person, call this person in every financial situation. So you need financial fitness to be reliant, economically reliant. God wants you to be economic. He doesn't want you to keep depending on that people. He wants you to be a giver not someone who is always receiving and it can, it can be quite embarrassing you know when you are a body to other people and some people are always waiting on their auntie uh, wait, waiting on their uncle or waiting on their brother or sister or some people are even waiting for politicians it's because you're not financially fit and it's so embarrassing you know if you have to constantly rely on people to eat food for transport money to pay school fees and then rent so that's why you need to be financially fit. It also helps you to live meaningfully, purposefully, and accurately. Yeah, because the purpose of money, having money in our lives, is not, is not conspicuous consumption. A lot of people think, you know, I've been seeing video of one certain man, you know, I think it's from South Sudan. And each time I see his video, it just makes me want to vomit. People don't understand the purpose for wealth. People think it's just, and then I, many of our young people, uh, once small money enters their hand, first thing they think about buying, type it in the chat and everybody. What is the very first thing before you even type it? Car. And then they buy a car. Um, next thing is to start traveling around, you know, a whole party in uh, Dubai, post on social media and things like that. That's not the purpose of, you know, financial fitness. You're there to live purposefully, to live meaningfully and to live accurately. Money instills discipline in your life. And then you find that when people are not, when people haven't made money the right way, there's no, there's very little discipline. But when you are the one who actually made your money, the way I'm going to tell you, you'll find that it will help you to live meaningfully, purposefully and accurately. Financial fitness is important, of course, to provide for our loved ones and those who depend on us. We, we can't afford to fail them. It's also important to express generosity to the poor. God cares for the poor people. God cares for the poor. And then I see and I meet poor people around me every single day. And each time I'm able to express generosity, even if it's a sim something as simple as, um, so one, uh, not long ago, um, I went to buy avocado peer from those sellers. And then I got there, I saw this woman. She was very well dressed, but you could tell that obviously, you know, because she was there. I met her pricing avocado there. She was pricing, um, there's a market we call Aheoho here. So she was pricing uh, the thing. The woman would tell her, okay, it's 350 or it's 400. She said, okay, why don't you can, please take 250 now? The woman said, no, I can't, you know, this one, whatever. She was there, I met her there. So, um, I picked my avocado and other people and I called the seller quietly and I pay, I gave her money for that woman for all the avocado that she wanted to buy. And I said, don't tell her, but just give her whatever. So I gave her like excess money. I said, just give her whatever she wants to buy, but don't tell her, you know, who the person was. But apparently, as I was crossing the, the road to go enter my car, you know, I saw the woman running after me to thank me. <laughs> so apparently the seller told her, oh, that man has paid for you. Um, and I find opportunities to do things like that, say, you know, severally. My wife and I find opportunities to pay school fees for many people within and outside the country. And I can't tell you the joy 
that just being able to give, to express kindness to, to the poor brings to our lives. And then you don't wait until you, you have before you give, because somebody said giving is not for the rich, giving is for the wise. And again, financial fitness also allows you to afford your dream lifestyle. Um, yeah, some of us have never really known what it, what it means like to um, travel first class, what it means to um, travel to exotic places and have a really good holiday. God, God is not against those things. Financial fitness will allow you to be able to do that. Okay. Now, um, the major reason for today's song is that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, there's a serious economic recession coming. Now, it's not because it should come. And I don't want to go into all that right now about how the the banking system of the world is creating all these artificial problems. Is the banking system, the monetary system of the world that's creating all these problems. They shouldn't be there because it's enough abundance for everybody created in this world. But because of all these things going on, um, people are you know, suffering. And all the indices, everything that shows uh, that the world is moving into a very deep um, valley of economic depression is right here, you know, upon us. So all the things, the geopolitics going on in the US and NATO um, and China and all those people, uh, even back home here in Nigeria, I think many of us are from Nigeria, there's Cameroon there. Um, so rising unemployment, you know, youth restiveness, lots of hopelessness among the people. People don't even know what to do again. People don't know, people are complaining. The uh, price of diesel um, is almost a thousand naira. Okay, so just sometime last year, I bought diesel for, I believe it was 300 naira. From 300, all of a sudden it just shot up and went to 600, 700. Now it's almost 1000 naira for a liter of diesel. My vehicle uses diesel. My generator also uses diesel. So we are all in this you know, together. And so people are finding it very difficult. Consumer spending, for those of you who run retail business, you can see that the consumer spending is also falling. There's a lot of credit, uh, there's a lot of stress in the credit market. People are finding it actually very difficult you know, to find money to do their business. And then many of you may have seen the kind of bumper, uh, profits that Zenith Bank, UBA, and like one other bank recently, I think it was GT Bank or something, declared incredible, like hundreds of billions. And people are wondering where this money came from. Or if there's economic crisis, why are these people? And there's a whole lot of things, you know, to it, which is part of why I think that uh, one takeaway from tonight is I would like all of you to start considering the stock market to start considering the stock market, um, to, to sharpen your knowledge and the, your ideas about what's going on in the stock market, you know, because it's, 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 the, it's the pulse of the economy. Yeah, but there's something that happened with those banks and there's, there's a, a connection between the bumper harvest that they're having. Because see, these people are growing, but the real economy is not growing. It's basically because they had done investments in the dollar when dollar was... Um, like is it 400 and something official and now you know dollar is um i think the official i don't know what the official is uh, as of now it's probably 700 and something naira um is devalued and so they are offloading some of these investments and then they are having all this swelling you know 340 something billion half quarter half sorry half a year that is insane and that's because of what's going on here so um, there's an upcoming recession and the way to deal with it is not to go around complaining or joining pity party or joining all these people, you know, who are, we know go agree, we know agree. It doesn't solve any problem. The answer to the upcoming recession is financial fitness. So you are so fit, it doesn't matter what is going on. You're fit, you have the ability to manage your financial well-being and you have immunity to whatever 
cons conspiracies that the monetary system uh, does. Okay, so this is where we're gonna pause. And um, so far have, um, so in five minutes would have done one hour. So we're really excellent in a good time. So we should be done in the um, next 30 minutes. So um, let's have our first question and answer. And uh, I'm going to stop sharing so I can see, we can see ourselves. Um, and so if you have a question, you can raise your hand and then Williams, you can recognize them or Patricia and we can answer. So, so far in what we've been talking about. So if you have a question or something else that is very personal and related to what we are doing, this is the time. So you raise your hand and then we, we recognize you. Okay, I don't, no question. I don't see any hand up. All right, so um, so do we go on? Type yes in the chat, let me know. Do we go on? We just continue. Type yes in the chat, no question. Okay, all right, yes, yes, yes. All right, so let's go on. Um, so let me now share with us the, the, the hand up. Okay. All right, so let's take the question. Um, all right, unmute yourself and uh, ask your question. Uh, okay, thank you. thank you so much, sir. Mm -hmm. um, so this is Okoro. My my question is: you you said you said all the problems are is connected to the banking system, and um, I thought that the banking system was a tool for economic growth. <laughs> so how come the banking system is uh, yeah. is kind of in the middle of all the problems? Uh, do we then stop using the banks? Um, this is a question which, um, if we tackle it from the root, we will not we will not go tonight, but let me see. Um, let me see how easily you know I can put it to, together for us. Um, what I would actually suggest that everybody here go watch. The reason I'm, let me tell you the reason before you go watch it. Many of us are trying to make money, and we don't even know what money is. So many of us wake up every day, <laughs> go to work. Okay, let's go to university, study this course, come out and then make money. And we don't even know what money is. That's why many of us never, you know, really make that money. There is a system in this world and um, there is the system, that monetary system. And if you don't understand it, the, the system will keep you, the system will keep you a slave. I mean, many Americans are discovering that for themselves. Right now, the data says that 60% of Americans are one paycheck away from being homeless. And then if you're watching what, what's going on in the US, people are becoming homeless. And then the homelessness, these are not... Before, you know, we saw homeless people in America, you know, I go, I see them. Then when you saw homeless people in America, they were, you know, drug addicts, you know, people, they call white trash and then, you know, so many blacks and all that. But these days you see computer engineers, well-trained people, software engineers living in their cars because of that same system. And the origin of the whole thing was before, in the evolution of money, people were using gold. Okay, so people were using gold to, to trade. Now, but over time, it got very difficult to start, because gold is, you know, if you for some of you have gold, <laughs> gold is heavy. And then you can only carry so much. So they started... Depositing it, depositing it with um, um, they weren't bankers, but that's what they became at the time. You know? So people who were 
you know, like gold merchants and all that. So they will deposit, deposit the gold. And then these people, these bankers, as it were, will give them receipts and paper, which they would basically use to buy things and to trade. Now, the problem was that after some time, they started giving more paper than the gold. And sometime in 1970-72, before that time, the money in the world was backed by gold because it's a precious commodity and it is rare. So there was something backing the gold, as backing the money. But then you may have heard about what they call the fiat currency. And then the central banking system, it, the problem actually started in 1913 when the central bankers, because if you hear central bank, like Central Bank of Nigeria or the Federal Reserve Bank of uh, US or the Bank of England, you think that is the government that has it. <laughs> Those things are not, the central bank does not belong to the government, including your own here. The central banking system, um, which includes the financial system, the World Bank, the IMF, the whatever. They are privately owned. The World Bank has nothing to do with it. It's privately owned. And so the problem that the world is having now is that we have more paper money than actual commodities backing them, like gold or like oil and all that. And that's what's creating this whole problem. So they just print money. And then you will also need to understand what is called the, uh, the I think it's fractional banking. I mean, if there's a banker here, um, you can also explain this thing, you know, better to, to us in the um, terminology. But see, when you take your money to the bank and you deposit uh, 1,000 Naira, they take 100 Naira and then loan 900 to somebody else with interest. Now that person pays the interest. Um, and, and so the thing is like, it, it's, it's like a pyramid scheme. The money system in the world is not real. It's kind of man-made. So, but it's not something that we're going to deal with tonight, but, uh, but I will put in the WhatsApp group, I will put a, a link to what I would like you to watch, to understand the money system. Because if you don't understand it, you know, why is it that it's so easy for a few people to make billion? for instance, in Nigeria. And then other people are doing the same thing and even more, and they're not making it. Why is it that um, you have a few individuals? In fact, in Nigeria, only 0.4% of the population have 500,000 <laughs> and above in their system. Why is it that they will give somebody, this is your central bank, will give somebody Naira, just before now, I don't know whether they have stopped it. They will get, when Naira was 300 and something, 300 and something Naira to the dollar, some guy actually got the dollar at 11 Naira. So how do you compete in that kind of system? So somebody is importing, they give him a concession and they're giving him dollars at a ridiculous rate. You go there, you go out there, import something for, for making cement. You go to import from the same place for making cement, but you're not spending the same money. So these are, that's it. So these are the things going on. And then part of why we're doing this is so that we'll be able to understand the system and know how to thrive in the system. Because if you don't understand the system, you can't make it work. So we can take that a little bit more, but it doesn't mean that you should not use the bank. But from my own and what I'm sensing around what is going on right now, um, I would personally not keep too much money in the bank right now. Not only the terrible inflation that is going on, but the devaluation is so steep that um, 1 million Naira in January this year would be like 400,000 Naira today. So any day your money is in the bank because of economic situations, right? Any day your money is in the bank, it's losing value. It's not going up. This is why I prefer to put it in the stocks because over time, stocks fluctuate. But over time, if you actually invest in very good stocks, over time, 
it does really work far much better than putting your money in the bank over time. I bought um, a, a particular stock for seven naira 11 kobo, not up to one year ago. Then last week, because I needed money to do something. So last week, I offloaded those shares at 20 naira 50 kobo. It wasn't up to, I don't think it's been, I don't think it's up to nine months I bought that, but I have, I have the records. Now, so that is almost 300%. So that has beaten inflation. It has beaten devaluation of the Naira and whatever. So what I put in there, so if I had put in um, uh, 10,000 Naira, so I'm coming out with like 30,000 in under one year. And there are stocks that do that sort of thing. Like if you, if you actually, you know, there's a book I wrote recently that explains most of these things in stocks. And then Williams, you can actually put the chart, the link to the chart. You will, you will see a lot of things explained of how these things work. Okay, so let's continue. We will be able to take some more questions at the end. I hope that helped. And then Williams, please remember so that we can put the link to the documentary because we need to understand what money is to make the money. Okay. So there are three steps. This is the final section for today. There are three steps to, to your financial fitness in getting ready for the times that are coming and in finding healing for your finances, in going from bad to poor to average until really, really very good. So this is what um this is what this these are the steps to do that. Okay, I think Gozi's hand raised. Um, is there some technical issue or you have a question? Can you all see my slides? Okay, let let Ngozi speak and then we can go on. You can unmute. Ngozi, please unmute. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. I uh, yeah, I I was I wanted to put the young man's heart at rest concerning the banks. Okay. You know, what we are experiencing, I, I'm sure you just grew up now, is not new. Uh, the, we, the older ones, and who have also worked in banking, there's, there is actually, in, a, in a, an economy that is not producing, uh, that is all about importation. And all about importation and quick money. The banks are not exempt. So the money that should have been used to do construction, importation of machinery, and the things that can manufacturing and things that can employ people is actually just moved to the Malams and back. And then so with a corrupt system that we have, most banks do not do any business other than sell money. So what they say when it talks about offloading, there are two ways they are making a lot of money. One is all the charges from our ATM. Hmm. When you deposit money, you pay something. The 20 cobo, now that everything is done, uh, you have to do teletransfer and all that. So is that what they call it? Yes, um, mm -hmm. uh, transfer from account to account. Yes. Every time I see a charge, that charge goes to the bank. Right. So for all of us that traded today, what we bought was food, though. what we bought was this, thing, but the person said transfer to me. Mm -hmm. You lost 20 couple. Hmm. And it didn't, uh, 20 couple or some other amount. But if you add up what we spent today, it's in hmm. the millions. Hmm. And then they are doing that then. So that is a major income resource for the banks, mm -hmm. apart from the insider trading that's going on between CBN and the banks. They know themselves. Right. They know how much they make. Hmm. And they, so the thing is, the, 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 the ordinary person suffers it. So they have been deferring this enormous profits 
for the past almost 20 years now. Hmm. But the economy has not improved. So, so in fact, yeah. the speculation, oh, hmm. but you're even putting it at 40%. The speculation wow. is that if the people we have in power now remain in power by this time next year, that Naira dollar will be exchanging for one. I said speculation, so don't quote me. Will be spent is changing at one dollar to one thousand five hundred naira. Mm. So those who have heard mm. are mopping up. Mm. So right. if if your money is liquid, mm. um, in naira, mm. the stock is a way. Then. If it's enough to buy property, because they, they the same people who have the mm -hmm. dollar are exchanging it to Naira, buying properties. And buying stocks too. And buying stocks. Mm -hmm. And buying whatever else, and including the gold. They are mm -hmm. buying gold bars and silver bars. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, don't um, worry yourself too much. The knowledge is good. And I'm also talking as someone who worked in the bank. So don't do yourself about what they are doing because it's a corrupt system like Ubo had explained to you. Mm. What fear for what you have now, what can be done with it? If you have Naira and it's enough and you have a domiciliary account for those of you who can, mm. your money, and I'm qualifying it, your money is safer in that losing of value and all of that. Mm -hmm. If you can change a different currency that is more stable. Mm -hmm. But I tell you something. When push comes to shove, if that money is in the Nigerian bank, you won't get it. Mm -hmm. Because that dollar, they will not give it to you. Because mm -hmm. the people inside need it more and they are trading with it. Mm -hmm. So you go there, they can tell you, we have your money. But we can only give you the equivalent in Naira. And of course, if the Naira has become that, the dollar has become like this amount now, even if they give you a trailer load of it or a bullion load of it, it's useless. Mm -hmm. It could become like Venezuelan money. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. information is key. And I remember one of my lecturers, when I was doing my master's, said something to me, to us. It was a political science class. Mm -hmm. He said, why fighting for the poor? Don't become the poor. Mm. I never forgot that thing because he said, even whatever policy they bring in now, it's still going to favor the banks and those people who right. are on top. So yeah. the climbing from uh, where I would say I am to where they are is far. But if you do not look at the top, just start the climbing. Mm -hmm. What we don't need don't purchase. Mm -hmm. Very good. What, what you can buy from the locally made is in, do. It helps the general economy. And then what you can produce, go ahead and produce. Many, many of us kept on hoping it will uh, get better. And so when a system is corrupt to the point that UAE is not giving visa to Nigerians, it's 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 difficult. So we have to understand that it's in the scriptures. The corruption of one officer affects the other and the other and the other and the other. Mm -hmm. And I hope that we, those of us who are listening to this, will not be the contributors to the corruption. That's why I chose to raise my hand to talk so right. that you, we know where we are and mm -hmm. what you can do for your self to help you. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you so very much. This was so, so helpful. Thank you very, very much indeed. And um, that's the entire conversation around financial fitness. Like I said, this is not a one day thing. It is uh, what we'll continue to. Somebody also asked in the chat in terms of investment vehicles. These are the things that we'll be talking about. Even like very simple things that um, I'm doing right now, you know, with my family. Uh, something as simple as if you can, if you can start by growing what you eat, 
because again, I don't want to sound alarmist and I don't want to sound like I'm a prophet of doom, but not just the way they are poisoning, deliberately poisoning food, the food that people, is is horrible um, in America now, which is, which is currently the sickest nation in the world. If you meet 10 Americans, um, <laughs> eight of them are on medication, or if not nine or something, or some kind of medication or the other. And then you see, um, in the Old Testament, God was telling the children of Israel that he was going to bless their food and their water because if you are eating right and drinking good water, the chances of disease coming in uh, will be little. But now um, you, you go to the market in Walmart and then you are buying uh, watermelons that when you get to your house, it's exploding because they are GMOs. Uh, watermelons that don't have any seed and all kinds of things that have been um, genetically modified, the lab meats that they want, they want to force the whole world to start eating and things like that. So something as simple as growing what you can, what you can that you eat, like in my house, the rice we're currently eating, we grew it. And then some people say, we're in Lagos, now it's not possible. Yeah, actually, if you find, you can always find a way because I had a friend you know, who lived in Palm Grove. He worked in the bank. And then he had a massive farm, you know, he had a farm somewhere, you know, and then the places in Ogun said, you actually rent a farm and give people the, the plant for you. Um, it will involve a lot, some little bit of work, but then you know what you are eating. So there are so many little things like that we're going to discuss. Um, how you can, okay, let me talk about the system first, and then I can tell you how you can use the system uh, whatever the banking system is doing, you can, you can use it you know, to wisely survive because if um, Daniel and his friends could survive in a place like as corrupt as Babylon was and do very well, uh, there's no reason we can't. And if Joseph you know, could lead an entire civilization you know, through one of the worst recorded re economic recessions in, hu in human history, then of course we are good, you know, we can do it. So the, step is, the steps are very simple. First thing is that you've got to know where you are right now. If, if I ask you, what is your net worth? How many of us actually can, without doing MM and all that, you know, even know what net, net worth is, you know, but, but you really, if you don't know where you are, it's going to be very difficult for, to, for you to know where you are going. And because a lot of things, a lot of us keep things in our head. We don't write things and we don't even know these things, you know, so what, what you need to know what is your what's your financial health now so we just did something qualitative when i gave you that exercise you know to indicate where you think your financial fitness is now so but you need to now turn those things to number you need to know exactly where you are as a family as a person what is your financial health situation what is your financial health status the second thing is to now define what does financial freedom mean to you? If you, if money were not an issue in your life, where would you be? If money were not the issue, what would you be doing? What impact would you be creating in the world? Where would your children be? Where would your family be? What would you do for your husband? What would you do for your children, for your, for your community? You've got to write it down. Um, I have an exercise for writing down your dream lifestyle. You, it, it needs to be written down. Okay, I'm painted. This is also where you can develop your vision board. So at the end of this life, at the end of it all, what would I look back to and say, wow, I really did very well. You need to think about these things you know, really, really you know, uh, deeply. What are you here for? What would you like to achieve? So you define that. Then the third thing is basically to bridge the gap between where you are right now, like in this your zero state to your 10 state. Very simple, very simple. It's the same thing like if you're trying to talk about physical fitness, when you go to the professional health person, the first thing they do is diagnosis. 
they have to, they can't start treating you when they have not done diagnosis. Anybody who is doing that, who does that to you is a quack. So they first of all want to know what is the status of your blood, of your heart, um, of your everything, all the things that they are checking. So that is that step one, diagnosis. If you do not know and sit down and actually know where you are. In fact, this is particularly important if you are owing. How many of us are owing money here? Maybe one of these days we should um, do something on debt because I, <laughs> I, am, I had PhD in debt. Okay? I was owing like three banks and different people. My car was repossessed and you know, all because the investment I put the money into, I borrowed from the bank, you know, failed woefully. Um, and so now managing debt, coming out of debt, there's a very simple process like this. You've got to write it down. Don't just carry that debt in your head. Because what happened to me was, because I, I didn't write it down, the debt now became so expanded, much, much bigger than it was actually, it actually was. And it was demoralize, demoralizing me. It was, um, you know, threatening me, harassing me, you know, robbing me of sleep. Until the day I actually sat down and wrote down this. And I was looking at the numbers face to face. And I said, wait a minute, this is not a big deal. Okay, so I think writing things down, assess your financial health status. How much are you owing? Who are you owing? What, is, what are the numbers? What is coming in now? Um, what is the deficit in my family budget? You know, so your house rent is two million. The total for the children's school fees. You, know, you have four children, and then the total in the year, the school fees you pay is, is five million. Uh, that's already seven million. Food and all that, and all that, and, and all that, whatever you know, travel. Let's say another three million. That's ten million. But then the combined income of the family is four million a year. How many people live in? So okay, let's say five hundred thousand naira a year, uh, a month. That's like six million. Okay, so that's the income. Six million against hundred. Uh, uh, six million against ten million that you actually spend. So you now you know where the deficit is coming from. You need to have it written down because you see when that thing comes down, you can begin to ask yourself, okay. So every year we actually leave 4 million Naira short. How do we bridge that gap? How do we add additional income stream to take care of this? But if you don't write it down and you don't know this status, it just hangs in your head and it becomes a bigger problem than what it actually is. Then number two, define your ideal lifestyle. You know, the house you will live in, the way you actually want to live, financially independent, what does it mean? You know, the things you want to do, you know, there's, there, there's some things we want to do, you know, for, for the young people in Africa, which we have started. So all those things, you know, you define them. Then follow a simple financial fitness plan. The reason many of us don't do well financially is that we are just doing it haphazardly. Somebody comes to them and, and tells us, oh, there's money in cashew ex exporting, exporting cashew. We do that one. Then as then we put our hand in that one two years after, nothing comes out of it. Then another person comes and tells us, ah, there's this new network marketing uh, in, in, uh, in that just came. If you bring three people who will bring three people each and all that within six months, you are going to hammer, you make 100 million. We put our hand in that one. Then, of course, six months, we run out of energy. And then somebody else comes and tells us, oh, where it is happening now is crypto. Crypto. If you can find 20 million somewhere and just put it in crypto, within 90 days or 180 days, you will buy a Lambo. We go and borrow money or we sell our land property, put in crypto, it goes. Then another person come, comes and tells us, oh, it's Forex. Oh, it's digital marketing. Oh, it's e-commerce. And that is why you never settle. You need to follow a plan. You cannot build generational wealth. But you know, if you look at the people who have built all these billions, they were doing one thing. So if there's one advice I want to give you uh, for tonight as we round off is be good at several things, but be great in one thing. You hear about Walmart. 
is one thing. You hear about Bill Gates is one thing. You hear about Steve Jobs, one thing. Uh, you know, you hear about um, Michael Jordan is one thing. One thing that you're really, really good at. So I'm already beginning to hint at the key. The radio episode today was talking about five weapons to defeat difficult economic times. The two I didn't speak about that I'm going to talk about on Monday are uh, skills, skills, and then ethics. They are weapons for defeating bad times. Okay, so follow a financial plan. My mentors say that no one can become rich. The guy is 84 years this year, going into 85 next year. He says no one can, very wealthy, accomplished man, one of the first few people who made money in, in, this, uh, in this country, in those days, those early days. Now, he said no one can become rich except another person shows him how. This is true. In trying to do it on your own, the quickest and the best thing to do is get somebody who has done this thing before. Okay, so in my company, we have been looking at, because we serve mostly our core businesses for businesses B2B. We're into consulting and coaching. And then these are very high ticket items you know, that we do, like really high ticket items. You know, when we work for, say, Flutter Wave or MTN or some of these other companies, you know, for a weekend, that's, that's, that's a high ticket. But we're not looking at how do we serve everyone else you know individuals you know who don't have that kind of money but they have a need so and then there's someone who plays in that space of how do you if you if we have um, a program or something that can help millions of people how do we get it across you know to them using digital marketing digital means and things like that so the first time I reached out to him, the first time, that was two years ago or so, um, and I called him, the, the, just one question. I said, okay, Mena, um, he's actually supposed to be on this call because I'd like to introduce him to you guys. It's quite good. I said, um, how much should I do? How much do I pay you for one hour of your time to show me how to, actually make money online not all these things people are talking or whatever i actually want it done how much money so i was on phone and then he told me this is the amount i wired that money to him and then that was the first ever time that i made money online on his own without my going to talk to anybody because he's been doing it he was good at it so i just reached out to him we also spoke day before yesterday. So we are starting something uh, tomorrow. Williams, I'm going to get back to you on that, you know, something with him tomorrow. I asked him, uh, how much should we pay you to spend this time to, to show us what to do? He, he's, he said it. And then I'm sending him that money. I did not even prize it. Because many times, the only thing holding you back is that you are trying to solve a problem that you're trying to learn everything and do it by yourself instead of reaching out to somebody who has done what you did and paying the person. And that thing can save you two years of trying to learn something and trying to do it on your own. You know, just mentorship. That, that's why I spent my biggest money, the biggest money I spend, you know, personally in my development is on coaching. Okay. So no one, so follow a system. Stop jumping around, you know, from farming to stock market. You can do all those things, but you need to do it within a system. Follow a system. That is what I'm doing right now. And then one of the things that system, following a system does for me is that it gives me patience. And then I do not feel anxious or depressed if something fails because it is within the system, in the long view, it's still okay. It's going to work out, even though right now I might be experiencing some uh, turbulence because I'm following a system. But if there's no system, then everything is an is isolated um, accident. And then it just puts you in confusion. So now this is the system I use for my coaching. And this is a system that we'll be teaching uh, in the radio program and that we'll follow here. Now, there's something that we call 
uh, I've come to call capital barrier. Capital barrier is that situation that you find yourself that you can't do anything because there's always a capital barrier. You can't fund your dreams. You can't fund your vision. You can't do what you want to do. You can't help other people. You can't impact lives. You can't provide for your family the kind of education, the kind of things you really want to provide for your family. You can't participate in what God is doing in the way you want to participate because of capital barrier. So how do you break it? And how do we break systemic and generational poverty? This is it here. This is it, you know. Um, if I were Paul, I would say I got this by revelation. So the first step is in the system is capital formation. Because if you don't form capital, if you don't somehow form capital, you can't even move forward. So many of us are stuck because we don't even have capital. And so when there's opportunity to, that comes our way, um, somebody wants to go, travel to Canada, and then they have 10 plus of land you know, somewhere, and they, they want to sell it off at a discount because they just need money to pay off something. And then that 10, uh, 10 plots ordinarily would have been like 20 million, but he wants to sell it off at 10 million or even 7 million because you are his friend, just pay 8 million. That's for the land that people were paying before you, you know, people are paying 30 million for that same land, but you're stuck because you don't have even 7 million. You can't make a phone call to get it anywhere. You don't have access to that kind of capital. So it's a capital barrier. How many people have found themselves in that kind of situation? I found myself in situations where there is a very beautiful plot of land, 540 plots of land somewhere, like ideal for what we want to do with fruit trees. But I had the capital barrier and I couldn't buy it at the time that it was offered. Anybody else who has experienced some capital barrier, there was an opportunity to invest, there was an IPO, say MTN, uh, was coming on offer, say at um, 50 Naira or 100 Naira. You couldn't take it. Now it is 270 and other. You know, just tap in the chat. Just say yes, yes, yes. Anybody? Anybody else experience capital barrier where you are not able to take advantage of opportunity because you don't have the capital? And in fact, many people complain, oh, yeah, I don't have capital. I can't start my business because I don't have capital and all that. Okay. Yeah. So I'm not alone. All right, so this is how to break the capital barrier because until you break the capital barrier, you will continue to miss opportunities that you need. So during the capital formation, that is where you pay off your debt because until you pay off your debt, you are going nowhere. I am telling you, paying off your debt. Not even do, like Ngozi was telling us, some people borrow from the bank and they do not intend to return to return it. And then these big people, you know, who borrow big money and then they have no intention to, to pay back. They borrow money and then they go marry or they travel or they buy things, you know, that they don't intend to, don't do that. You know, um, there's a spiritual law, you know, that says that a weak, the wicked borrows and they don't pay back. Okay, and then you are not the wicked. This is where you also break the survival barrier. Because there are some people who just wake up and then the only thing is, what do we eat today? How do we pay transport from here to here? That's a terrible system to find yourself or caught up in the web of what do we eat? How do we pay rent? How do we pay school fee? How do we pay, 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 pay bill? So when you find yourself in that web, you need to get out of it, all right? This is also where you begin to start shop financial seed. So in the capital formation, there are two, basically two systems. The, the one you either take a job or you go the route of actually maybe three systems you take a job or you go the route of um, entrepreneurship or you go the route of investing all right and then this is where you stash up money you, you save saving is critical in the capital commercial uh, formation some people say oh i earn only forty thousand naira a month that one is not even enough for our food how can we save Saving is a habit. It's not about the amount of money. So in 40,000 Naira, if you can't save 10%, save 5%. If you can't save 5%, save 1%. Just let your brain, let your spirit get used to not consuming everything 
that comes in, make it a habit. It doesn't matter the amount. So if you can save 1% of 40,000 Naira, save 0.1%. But by all means, let something, something be saved, even if it's 400 Naira out of that, because you're sending a message, a very strong message to your neurology that you see, because whatever money comes into your, uh, your system is either uh, bread, in fact, two things, if all the money that comes in, all the income you get has two components. One part is the seed and the other part is the bread. So only a foolish person eats the seed and the bread. So something must always, even if it's 100 naira, 400 naira, is seed. Because usually seed, if you have one tomato seed, just it's tiny. So it's okay if you can save for 4,000. It's okay to save 400 or 100. It's called a seed. Because when you plant one tomato seed, it brings, it gives you three baskets or something of harvest. So the same thing with your money. These are the kind of things, you, the capital formation is the most difficult part because until you break it, you can't go anywhere else. All right. So in the course of our weekly, um, in the course of our weekly master classes, we will delve a little bit more in each of these stages and then I will also provide you worksheets to implement it. It does not matter if you are zero stage. The first thing to think about is not to, is not to start creating a set. You need to break, you need to form capital first. Then from there, you can now start asset creation. And then you now multiply the money by scaling up all the wealth. And then you go into heritage. This is where you create trust, you build estates, you build a legacy for next gen for future generations, such that some people have created this system and established this such that their next three or four or five generations are completely secure financially. And then we actually owe it, whether we are man or woman, we owe it to the next generation to of our offspring, of our offspring, not to continue the struggle. I'm not saying that they should not suffer or that they should not learn. The discipline because that's part of what you you know in this stage four the heritage building is not just about building um trust and then building investments for them it is actually more about the character because if you don't build their character and their values then they can take all that money that you created all the wealth you created and that's it. the next generation they just wipe it out it happens all the time you know because the children were not made wise, they were not helped, they were not trained. So it's not just about money, but a lot of training. So we have this system that we run. So you don't need more than this. You do not need more than, you just need to follow a system. Where are you right now? Maybe the most important part where you are right now is capital formation. That's where many of us, from our answers, that's where really many of us need to be. We need to solve the problem of capital in our lives. And then some people want to fast forward it by borrowing. It's okay to borrow if you know what you're doing. You know, if you know what you're doing with borrowing, it's okay to borrow. But usually I tell my business clients, don't borrow money. The, the, the best time to borrow money is when you don't need it. So I had a client in Enugu. Um, they, are, they are into farming, into agriculture. And at the point that we engaged, a bank, Fidelity Bank, approved a loan of 200 million naira, you know, for him. When I looked at his business, looked at the business model, I told him, please, sir, don't take this thing now. Wait, let's do some work because you cannot use money to solve business model flaws. If your business model is flawed, even if you put 1 billion naira in it, you will destroy it. So if you know what you're doing, capital formation, uh, taking a loan can accelerate it. Taking a loan can accelerate it. But my experience you know, with people you know, who borrow money in Nigeria, um, for, for every one good story you hear, you probably hear like 20 something terrible stories. People are losing their houses 
which they use as collateral. Every day, people are losing property every day. And there's so many loan sharks taking advantage of these people. So for the capital formation, you can see that the totem I use for that there, if you can see the slide, is a snail. This is the place you actually take it up. Go slow, learn, build capital. Even if this is, even if you give yourself like three years of consistent, the system I'm going to teach you because capital formation has a system. As like each of each of them has a system. If you follow it and you give yourself time, the amazing thing about capital formation is that it might be very slow. But the moment it hits a certain threshold, you will be amazed. Everything just explodes, you know, like the proverbial Chinese bamboo uh, bamboo tree. You keep watering it, you keep whatever, you don't see anything. Then after like five years, all of a sudden, within a period of um, a couple of weeks, it grows 90 feet, but you don't see anything there. That is what happens in that capital formation. So avoid the temptation of get rich quick. Get Rich Quick dealt with me. I lost so much money in Get Rich Quick schemes and all that. And at the time I was doing it, I wanted to accelerate capital formation. Capital formation is hard. It is slow, but it's excellent. You go through it, you break that survival thing, hand to mouth. Because as long as you're living hand to mouth, it's going to be very difficult for you to put aside for asset creation and then asset growth and heritage building. All right, this is where I just wanted to introduce you to the system. Uh, this is where we're going to um, end today. Um, but the workbook, the financial fitness workbook is um, um, something I would like you to, every one of you to, so I'm gonna put the link to getting it in the chat. Uh, so I would like all of you to get it and feel it when we come on Saturday, we start from there. Because this thing needs, um, it needs consistency, okay? It needs some kind of follow-up. Um, it's actually some kind of mentorship that I'm offering here as a covenant between me and um, God that I would like to, help 10 million Africans to, okay, uh, thank you. I, someone says it's a tortoise, not, not a snail. Yeah, it's, um, and as a matter of fact, it can also be snail. But why I like tortoise is that tortoise is also seen as a wise, um, <laughs> as a wise uh, person, as a wise creature. Okay, so the link to getting the financial fitness workbook to summarize everything, everything that we have done today and to help you journal and write down things and think. It's in the group chat. Copy it or go there right now and get uh, and download a copy. And then we can use our remaining um, couple of minutes um, to take the final Q and A before we say good night. All right. Any questions? We can take one or two, if there's any question. All right, um, so we take Yinka and uh, one more, one more. Is there any more? All right, so we take Yinka, Yinka and, um, Okay, of course, also has another question. Okay, so let's take those two and then we, we round off. Go ahead, uh, Yinka. Uh, good you. evening, sir. Good evening. Good evening, sir. Go for it, we can hear you. Okay. So, thanks for the lecture, it has been interesting. And the question is, when do you know you save a lot to start investment? Uh, let me back up this question with uh, the life story of mine. Uh, and I, 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 I need to tell you, uh, last month, as in two months ago, I saved a little money 
I've been always wanting to invest in things. So I saved a little money. I invested in this uh, logistic business. And I think I did my due diligence. I tried to find out what and what I should do. Unfortunately, the human uh, part of it, I lost all the money in in two months. Understand? So I want to know when you will know you save enough because this has been a recurring event. In 2005, I saved also invest in stock. By 2008, my investment of like one point something million dropped to like 250,000 naira. So I want to know actually when you know you save enough to invest. Thank okay. you. That's my question. Okay. No, that's a good question. Um, and the part of the reason I wrote the the book on stocks because I've been playing in the stock market for 20 years. And um I tell you is it's been very, very rewarding, you know, for me, because the, the best approach to the stock market for me is not this day trading, is the long-term view. Um, so that is one. Number two, um, the title of that book is How to Invest and Earn in the stock, uh, Nigerian Stock Market even with as little as 5,000 Naira. So the moment you actually have savings that you don't need to, uh, you, you found that, for instance, you have uh, some amount of money, but as far as I'm concerned, even 5,000 Naira, okay? I, if, if I can, I don't want to have even 5,000 Naira in my bank account except um, it is part of the emergency because it's so important to have an emergency fund. But what I do in case of my own emergency fund is I put it in the stock market because it's very liquid and I buy only top stocks. I buy only blue chip stocks. I don't buy penny stocks. And because um, I have bought a stock before, which is not even penny stock, um, but it was difficult you know, to sell it. But basically, I put it there instead of in the bank because it's, it's very liquid. Yeah, it's very liquid. So if I need to, so sometimes even the, the house rent, you know, if I'm going to pay house rent in December and I get some bulk money now, I put it in the market. And then when it is December, I, I sell it because it's very liquid. So if I sell today, the money is available in three days because Nigerian Stock Exchange is still doing T, T plus three days. Now, so once you start saving, actually, and then you start saving regularly, I think it's time to begin to invest. Your question is actually what should you invest in? Yeah, because for instance, you can invest in this, you can invest 5,000 Naira in the stock market. So my progression would actually be start buying stocks because 5,000 Naira can do much, but it's good enough to start with, okay? Then you can focus on one stock, like I'm actually encouraging people to do MTN as of now, because um, I'm, I'm following the company. Um, I not only train them, like work for them. So I'm following the company and I can see that they have as of now, they have very good fundamentals. So you can start buying, buying, accumulating stocks. Like what happened to me when I joined Chevron? Um, they gave us, they usually will give us money to buy cars. Then after five years, they will give you um, money for house. I use my own money, the money they gave me for car. I, use, I, I even borrowed money, added on top of it and then bought car. I mean, I didn't mean to pay things like that. I was a science student and nobody ever told me about working with money. And then, but I had a very smart colleague. You know what this guy did? He put it in stocks. Uh, five years after, if he wanted to buy, in fact, he bought a house. 
you're about to have somewhere along that um, lucky axis. But the car I bought with my own, you know, was already dead and I was already into the next car. So the short answer to that is once you start saving, I for me, it might be bad advice, but I don't really like to put bulk money and then just let it sit in the bank, except it is emergency fund. Because um, in the US, they will advise people to have about three to six months emergency for the worth of you know like if you're earning if you're earning two hundred thousand naira a month the advice you should have at least 1.2 million naira set out should anything happen to that job and then you lose it then you have six months worth of um income to to think about other things to do but i say in nigeria if one can do it do one year <laughs> You know, do one year. US has more supporting systems than we do here, but at least six months worth of so that can sit, sit in the bank. Every other thing should be invested. So no amount is too small, you know, for investment. So the question should actually be what what? Now, if you can do, if the money becomes big enough, you can actually pull it out from the stock market and do real estate and do land banking. Okay. And Land is not just, real estate is not just building houses. Like people think, once they think, say real estate, people just think it's building houses, residential and office houses, and then renting. Real estate has so many more ways people make money, so many more ways. So over time, we'll be talking about this and we can't exhaust everything tonight. But no amount is too much, too much to, uh, too late to, to start investing. At least start with stocks because 5,000 can do that build it up and then you can pull out and then do real estate because ultimately i think my favorite thing is real estate my favorite thing personally is real estate and agriculture okay so right now i'm investing in trees economic trees um it's a long-term thing but it's a, another fantastic use of land people will always eat who would have believed you know we just went to my to farm today uh, my wife and i and then um, we planted a few uh, sour sops. And then the young man was like, you know, who would have believed 10 years ago that you pick one sour sop in this country and then they will tell you one sour sop is 3,000 naira. Has anybody experienced it? 2,000, 3,000 naira. And then I tell you, people are buying sour sop, one sour sop, 2,000 today. I can tell you that in another five years, you'll be buying one sour sop for 6,000 naira, 7,000 naira. Because who thought that uh, orange, there was a time orange, you know, even in Lagos, five oranges, they will give you, uh, is it five oranges or something for like uh, 50 naira or something like that. Today, you're buying one orange for like 100 naira so that you can use the land for so many things. I hope that helps. Let's take only one more so that we can. Um, um... So, please, uh, Mr. Bo, let me, can I say something to him? There's an aspect okay. that you haven't covered. Okay, please. On his question. Okay. okay. He he said he invested before. That is a human problem. Is a human problem. Well, from my experience, what's why I, I wanted to speak into that to all of us is in banking, there are three things that they consider before they give credit. And the the personality or the integrity or the track record of the person that you are going to associate with in business is, mm -hmm. the, is the greatest part of your investments. Many of us have been thoroughly um, <clears throat> sold to the, to the marketing, to the mouth, to the words, to the projection, the calculator of what mm -hmm. you will make. Mm -hmm. And then we lost the one we had, the one we didn't have, and we now owed money. So at least you get the benefit of the experiences we've had. And so I'm telling you here that the biggest mistake you made in all your investment was the people. Mm -hmm. So, the, so, so the, 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 the character of the people, so mm -hmm. the, the character is, is number one. So in the future, do not just listen mm -hmm. to the projections. Mm -hmm. Just go back and your due diligence is on the character. Mm -hmm. 
Very good. Not, not on the projection. The, the character, if if there are there are risks in business, but there are certain risks that when you look back to when you started, you could have you should you had no business entering it at all. Yeah. Then another thing is don't uh, look for the the you know we've talked about the thirties here, but don't look for that the quick quick ones that look like. In fact, I see them all around me. And when you have liquid cash, there's the temptation mm -hmm. to to invest. It's now that if you don't have the cash and and that you begin to say, eh, eh, but if you have cash, there's that temptation. But right. the mistake you've made so far is on this character of the people right. you invested in. In Thank fact, you. most people, not, sorry, one second. Most business people in Nigeria say their businesses failed because of their employees or their partners. Mm -hmm. Not because what the, the idea was wrong. Thank you. All right. Thank you so very much. You covered that very well. In fact, uh, we'll go into the details of these things as time. We still have, um, uh, it's still um, like uh, 1 a.m. in the morning <laughs> in our journey. So we have all these things covered <clears throat> because um, um, one of the, like you said, you know, one of the biggest mistakes people make in investment is to listen to other people without doing their own due diligence. It's still important to uh, listen to people, but you must do your own due diligence. And then the other hard lesson I learned about investment is never put money, never invest in something you don't understand. That is the law number one. All the times I've lost money were things I really, really, you know, um, I got my hands bound because I really, really did not understand it very, very well as much as I tried. Um, Kalista's hand was up before. Is Kalista still here? Um, Kalista, are you still here? Okay, Okurunwenye, let's make it a very, very snappy one. I didn't want us to go beyond the 22, 15, 15. Very snappy place. Okay, so thank you, sir. So my question is around this capital creation mm -hmm. for a civil servant. Mm -hmm. I ask because that's my primary constituency. Yeah. And sometimes when you look at the spread of salary of a civil servant, if he's being honest, just, just that salary, it might be from, let's say, averagely 40 something thousand at entry point, you know, at state level for most states to, 120, 130, you know, between level eight and level 16. And this can take, in the very least, 20 years or 25 years to achieve. Right. Okay. All right. So I, I, I get the, the point. Um, one, you know, people... Um, People underestimate the, the power of their salaries. And people actually have, people underestimate because I think most people look at that. When you say that 40,000, people look at it as if it's only bread, you know, just something you eat and spend. But it is a law that if you can't pay yourself first, you no know, matter, even if it's too naira, you will, you will not succeed financially. And secondly, it's not about the amount of money. I that speak to you here, I can't tell you, I can't even mention because it's unbelievable, the amount of money that I was earning a month in Chevron and then in Shell, I can't even mention that amount of money because the thing is embarrassing to me. There was a time that Chevron, I told this story in my first book, Financial Freedom for Every Youth. By the way, that's also available on um, online. Um, I told the story how the, um, the Chevron came up one time in those days, and then they developed um, an app far back as that time that allowed every employee to see how much the company had paid him or her throughout the period of that employment. When I saw the money that went through my hand, I said, you know, the way this, uh, the way Nigerians, I say it's a lie. I say the devil is a liar. <laughs> but when I started going through the items, 
line by line, I was shocked the amount of money that had gone into my hand within the time that I worked with them. So it, now, then there were people who were earning, at least I knew a particular sister, a civil servant. She was earning just one tiny fraction of what I was earning in Chevron. Do you know that these people built house? Do you know that they drive us, Chevron driver, people driving us, they build houses because they will go to places like Eiji, will go to Moe. But me now, a Chevron guy, I'm going to live in VGC or Ikoi. And so why those people were going to those places and they were able to little money, buy their whatever, build their house. They were living in their own house. Me, big man, Chevron guy, uh, they will be answering you, Sasa. But they were living in their own houses. Does anybody, has anybody experienced what I'm telling you about? Just type it in the chat, type yes. So it's not usually about the money. It's the habit, and I want to emphasize that. But we need to change our orientation about this money is too small. The moment you get that habit, when, once the habit of saving, I'm almost trying to call it the spirit of saving. Once it comes into you, you will be amazed what you can do with that 40,000 naira. But that spirit has to come inside you, first of all, because all of a sudden you start seeing places that you're wasting money that you didn't even know. You start seeing um, the you know um, when I work um, when I work with some clients or some audiences, I ask them how many of you here have clothes that you have not put on in the past one year, and it will shock you. Even in the place you think people are poor, <laughs> clothes and shoes. And then one particular woman in a, a place said she was so guilt stricken. She said she has boxes of clothes that she has not touched for. Three years, that is money. Because anytime you see inventory, it is money. It is money in prison. If you had clothes three years, you've not opened it. You've not touched it. You've not worn it. It's not your own. Meanwhile, it is money trapped. And then they'll be complaining, oh, we don't have money to pay school fees. But you have things trapped. So I'm just saying, it's not about the amount of money. It's the, it's the habit, it's the mindset. The moment you decide, in fact, the year I started, um, the year I started investing in the stock market, when I saw the volume of my transactions at the end of the year, I did not believe it, where that money came from. I'm telling you this thing, you know, they talk about miracle money. The real miracle in money is to start saving don't consume everything that comes. The moment you do that, the spirit of finance will penalize you. Now, if you're able to save 400 out of 40,000, somehow you start seeing money coming. Second thing, what our parents did. My father, my mother, for instance, were civil servants. When my father died, and then we're looking through the, you know, his property, and, I, and we saw his pay slip we were shocked up to today. I don't know how my father did it for seven of us, taking us through tertiary, seven of us. And, and you know, my father, with that thing he was earning. But then as I think about it, you see, my father farmed, my mother farmed. So most of the things that we were eating came from our farm. The garu that we were eating came from my mother's farm. And she always had cassava. The vegetables we were eating. So sometimes I remember she would wake up very early in the morning and go to the farm, bring back a basin of vegetables. It came from my mother's farm. My father always had a yam farm. Even in Amenu where we're living, he always had a yam farm. And so I'm beginning to think that that was extremely helpful. My mother also had um, a, a farm uh, she inherited that had oil palms. So she used to make oil. So we had our oil. Uh, we had yam. We had Gary, seven children that they had, seven of us. We had, and we're always very healthy. Safe for service. I'm telling you, there's abundance and there's always a way out. Okay, so we're going to stop today. Uh, there's a lot more, don't worry. There's a lot more coming and then we get some more. Sometimes I think we'll just take questions and answers. Um, so same time, same link next Saturday. Um, I see that one person or two of you have already gotten the workbook. I would encourage everybody, don't just learn 
please get the workbook. Click on the link that is there. And uh, Williams, you can also publish it in the chat and then the stock market book you know, for them. Uh, use those materials. They are very, very practical. And um, um, I'll have a date with you this time again next Saturday. Thank you all very much. So now the last thing before you go, just tell me in the chat, everyone please will appreciate that uh, just before we end the, the, the meeting. <laughs> Please type in the chat, what was your aha moment today? Your aha moment was, what was it you really heard? What is it you're going back with? What was it that, you know, that when it hit you, it was like, this is lightning. All right, so just type it in the chat. I would like to take a look at it. What was your aha moment? What made your day today? What did you hear that really made your day and that you're going to act on? Please type it in the chat very quickly. We'll wait to do that because this, this is our ritual. We always want to know what we should emphasize. Okay, be good at many things, but great at one thing. Awesome, excellent, thank you. Okay, everybody would like to hear, I would like to hear what was the most valuable thing you heard today? Your aha moment. Okay, determine your net worth, good. Capital formation, all right. Okay, very good. There are many of us needing this help. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's why we are here. Uh, over time, we'll see how we can network within the group to actually support each other because building wealth is easier when we do it in a group. Okay, all right. Keep going, keep going, keep going. I think I've seen for just four people, we are 28. Yeah, okay, capital formation could be slow. Yes, yeah. And then I must add, Stephen, that, it should not just be slow. It should be very, very, it should be a definite plan. Not just slow for the purpose of being slow. Okay. Capital formation. All right, good. Chima said more like a surprise. I could save from 40. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In this economy. Yeah, you can. Excellent. Caleb, no one can become rich except another person shows him how. Okay, very good. How? Mm -hmm. Okay, keep going, keep going. Let's do that in the next one minute. Keep going, please, everybody. What was one major aha moment you know, for you? Capital formation. Okay. All right. And then what we will do, we will continue in the, um, we'll continue in the chat. Okay, it can grow your own food, absolutely. And then even for some of us living in the city, um, I was amazed, you know, I saw a video not long ago about uh, a man who was planting yam in sacks behind his house. And then the place we stay in Lagos is quite small. But, um, you know, my wife has been able to grow even basic vegetables like basil, like uh, nchangu in pots. There are many things you can grow in pot. I attempted... Um, hydroponic farming, it didn't work out very well. We spent quite a lot of money that didn't work out. We wanted to grow our tomatoes, but it is possible. Some people are actually doing it. Okay, most money problems, as Uvike said, are not lack of money. Yeah, they are not money related. Yeah, Kalista, invest only in those things you understand very well. Excellent. All right, so I want to thank all of you very well. It's been my pleasure indeed. And I'm glad that um, to hear that this has been very um you know interesting time for you as well so uh, you all have a good night and then enjoy the rest of your weekend and i'll see you exactly the same time on saturday okay goodbye everyone